Ooh. Okay, well, since I uh, just forwarded the screen, we will go ahead and get started. And if people pop in, we can certainly allow them in as we go. But I want to thank everyone for joining me today for our webinar about talking with children about dementia. My name is Megan DeBolt. I'm the relationship manager here at Elder Law of East Tennessee, and I'm also a certified child life specialist. So the role of a child life specialist is certainly to help children and families understand complex health experiences, new diagnoses, procedures, and just really cope with a lot of the healthcare challenges that, that adults and kids face. So I was excited when we were thinking about a webinar of adding this topic to our, to our wheelhouse, especially this time of year as we head into the holidays and we're looking at seeing loved ones around the table again. I'm also part of the sandwich generation. So thinking about uh, not just raising my young family, I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old that I'm responsible for, but also I have my mom who I'm also still helping. And so there's a lot of demands on my time and how do we help make this time of year as stress-free as possible and as positive as we can. Uh, looking at our agenda quickly for the day, we're thinking about a quick overview of what dementia is. I wanna go through, through child development, those stages, and maybe some tips we can use in each of those stages, phrases, and just different examples of what we might be experiencing. And then end with resources. You know, this is kind of um, biting off a big elephant, trying to think about how do we talk about Alzheimer's and dementia with children? Because uh, every situ everyone's situation is unique and everyone's situation is different. So your, your loved one may be in a nursing home. They may be moving in with you uh, or they may still be living independently or maybe they're out of state. So uh, the conversations may look a little bit differently, but hopefully this gives a good context for at least jumping off and having some of those conversations. Oh, sorry, I'm, I see the chat. Am I missing anything? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm uh, not the most tech savvy human being. So the Alzheimer's Association defines dementia as an umbrella term, right? For loss of memory, language problems, problem solving, and other thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. And I think the big piece there is daily life, right? This isn't something that just happens occasionally or every now and then we forget where our keys are or we forget that person's name. This is every day. And we know that under that umbrella, there's different types. So certainly Alzheimer's is one that's very familiar. There's also vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, other forms of dementia, including Huntington's and mixed dementia, meaning that you know you may have one or more of these types of dementia. Thinking about Alzheimer's disease, so taking it down a step further under that umbrella, we know that Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia and it accounts for 60 to 80% of the cases. Specifically, it affects memory, thinking, and behavior. And one of the key things is it worsens over time. We know there's not a cure, we know this doesn't get better, but that these symptoms progress over time. I want y'all to keep this in mind as we work through this presentation today over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, I want you to keep these stages and some of the symptoms in mind and think about how we might talk about that with our children of different ages. So that early stage or mild, we're looking at some of the symptoms interfere with some daily activities. It may include difficulty with word recall, again, losing items, misplacing things, important paperwork, things like that, and trouble with planning. Maybe we're getting more anxious or more irritable, but we're just having trouble executing, maybe following simple recipes, things like that. Um, people in this stage are certainly still living independently. They may have a little bit of help from, from an adult child or from a caregiver that comes once or twice a week with helps with housekeeping or med management, but they're still pretty independent in this stage. When we move into that middle stage or moderate, we're really thinking that these symptoms are starting to interfere with many daily activities. So we're needing help on a daily basis with several things. Uh, more word confusion. Our sleep patterns are changing. Maybe we've got our nights and days mixed up. We're forgetting things about ourselves, our own personal history or events, um, and we're getting lost more. Our behavior is changing. We're not acting how we used to or what was more typical of us in the past. So maybe this person is living and thinking about independent living. Maybe we've got a caregiver that's coming into the home. 
um, but we're certainly needing more and more assistance. So whether that's demands on mom, uh, adult children um, in combo with caregivers, you know, that can look in a myriad of different ways, but certainly needing more help. And that late to severe stage symptoms are most daily activities, right? So a person in this stage is very likely in a memory care facility, a nursing home facility, and, and needing almost full support around the clock. They have difficulty recalling recent experiences. They may be unaware of their surroundings. We're not walking, sitting. We can't swallow, maybe. And just overall difficulty communicating. People in this stage are certainly also more vulnerable to infection, uh, vulnerable to falls, things like that. So. Um, they, they may end up hospitalized for a myriad of reasons, but the, the Alzheimer's or dementia is certainly contributing to, to the reason for that illness. Again, um, these stages kind of help determine how much assistance our loved one needs and also how much that impacts our family and how we're functioning. Keep this in mind again as we move through our presentation. So thinking about the stages of child development in child life, we certainly study this a lot. Uh, so pull out your psychology 101, dust that hat off a little bit. You'll probably be familiar with some of this, but we're gonna talk about Erickson and Piaget. As we look at this, um, you know, Piaget was a cognitive theorist who really um, believed that children take an active role in their learning. So they learn through doing, and certainly they begin to assimilate new information based on experiences and through doing. So. I, at a young age, maybe at one, can recognize that that noise from that thing over there, that is a dog. So my pet in my house is a dog, and that cat over there that made a noise is a dog, and all of these things are dogs. The horse that I'm looking at is also a dog, because that's my experience. But as I get older, I'm able to discern they're animals. There's different types of animals. This is a horse. This is a cat. This is a dog. And so that was a lot of Piaget. And as we get into Erickson, we know that Erickson was a big social emotional um, development theorist. And he really believed that um, development was impacted by social interaction and relationships. And so he really looked at that and divided it into stages um, and things that we need to master through those stages. So those five stages we're gonna be looking at, um, well, really today we're gonna focus on four, but the main five stages that you often hear about are infants, early childhood or toddlers, our preschool age group, our school age group, and then moving on into adolescence. Um, you know, certainly keep in mind that there's all kinds of different tools used to measure development, uh, physical development, emotional development, all of those things. And that development is fluid, especially when we're thinking about social and emotional development. I might regress through different stages and move back forward at different points in my life. So um, just keep that in mind. And the other piece of this is really, um, children, no matter what, are really understanding and experiencing more than we think. So we might be thinking we're having a conversation about grandma who we're really worried about in the kitchen and that Sally, the, our three-year-old, doesn't hear any of that because she's in the other room playing. But children are perceptive. They pick up on our stress. They pick up on our social, our nonverbal cues, and they also pick up on our verbal cues. So um, we'll use that as we kind of move through this as well. So breaking it down by age group, like I said, um, we're going to focus on four. I kind of skipped over our infant group really just for time today. Um, but that doesn't mean that our infants aren't important. Our infants are vital. Um, having a good experience in infancy certainly leads to all kinds of, of mastery in childhood and adulthood. So we need to form those healthy attachments as infants. Um, infants certainly feel mom's stress, feel mom's worry. Um, they're picking up on that environment around them. But also we've seen in, in the research that infants can be very beneficial to our loved ones with Alzheimer's, right? Holding a baby can be very comforting to a distressed um, elder who maybe has some early dementia. Um, so babies can be very important. They need a lot of love from us. They need a lot of consistency but they also can really help um, bond with our, with our elders who may have dementia. I wanna focus on our first age group for today's conversation though, looking at early childhood. So we're thinking about 18 months to three years. And what we know about this group is they are 
And Piaget says they're pre-operational and they're in Erickson's stage of autonomy versus shame and doubt. So what does that really mean um, when we think about this? We know this group is egocentric, right? It's all about them. It's all about their immediate needs. It's all about the present. We aren't thinking about the past or the future. It's what's right here, what's in front of me, and what do I need? We're seeing language really burst at this age vocabulary is um, growing and children are just learning to express themselves. We can see a wide range of emotions um, at any time from this age group, right? We can go from happy to sad in um, you know, a matter of seconds. So we see all of those different emotions start to really come into play. We can represent things symbolically. So maybe this block is really a monster or this broom is my horse that I'm gonna ride on, right? We can use those things to represent We've kind of mastered the concept of um, object permanence. So I know that if just because mom steps out, the, out of the room, she's not gonna be gone forever. She's gonna come back even though I can't see her. We're very literal in our understanding. So if I tell my three-year-old that grandma is gonna have a CAT scan, um, my three-year-old might think, hey, they're gonna scan grandma's cat. What, what does that mean, right? We're just very literal. We're learning through pretend and role play. Play is huge at this age. Play is this child's work in this age for sure. And we're, we're beginning to pretend and we're trying on different roles of mommy and daddy and trying those different things. This age needs all the independence they can get, right? This is the, I wanna do it myself. Don't do it for me. Um, give me that. I'm gonna do it, all of that. So we're really searching to assert ourselves and that autonomy. We still see death as reversible. So um, again, if it's outside of my immediate everyday experience, um, it, it, it's reversible. It's not permanent. Um, it doesn't mean a whole lot to a child in this stage. So how do we help children in early childhood kind of wrap their mind around what's going on with our loved one with dementia? And one of the best things we can do is offer simple and basic explanations. Now this is hard because something I'm gonna ask you to keep in mind is that when we're gonna to talk to any child about um, a, a diagnosis or something important, an important conversation, we certainly wanna plan that out. We wanna plan when the conversation is gonna be. So I don't wanna do it around nap time. I don't wanna do it you know, in the car when they're overly hungry. Um, and who's gonna participate? So do mom and dad need to be there? Does the elder who maybe has dementia wanna participate? All of those things we wanna think about in advance with any stage. Uh, this early childhood group makes that a little bit harder because I would, I would kind of say that this may happen as you go um, and as they experience some of these things. So when I say simple basic explanations, it may be pointing out, sometimes grandma forgets to take her medicine. Mommy reminds her so she can stay healthy. Um, and it's something simple and basic and you continue with doing what you're doing. Um, and, and, and making those little comments over and over again. Another important thing is to reinforce familiar routine. So keeping naps and bedtimes consistent when possible. Now it's not always gonna be something that we can do and it's not always realistic to put that pressure on yourself, but keeping things as consistent as possible certainly will help your toddler and the sage know what to expect. Um, offering choices is always a big one, right? Because they want to assert that control. We want that autonomy. So the choice might be, we're going to visit grandma today at her new apartment. Do you want to bring her flowers or candy? It might not be a choice that we're going, but the choice is, you know, what do you want to bring to her and giving them some options. And then as always, encourage child-directed play with open-ended materials. Play is, play is a child's work and play is so important for children to process their experiences. So giving them paper and crayons or paint or Play-Doh or um, open-ended toys is, is a great way for children to kind of master their experience and, and have an outlet for coping. So moving on into our preschoolers, this is certainly one of my favorite age groups. We see um, just a burst of development at this age and such rapid change. So we're still pre-operational in our thoughts, but we've moved into this stage of initiative versus guilt. We want to try new things. Our pretend play is becoming more complex. Um, so it is... Um, taking on more um, more complexities, right? So there's different roles and there's different characters and 
Um, we can change roles. We can go from being the mommy to the baby, to the nurse, to the doctor, right? So we're seeing lots of complex play here. We're trying on different roles based on our experiences. So I just went to the doctor. And so now I'm really focused on doctor play and you're seeing that come out in your child. Great, huge imagination. Certainly reading always helps with this too, but we're creating very um, complicated games, right? We really see this emergence of magical thinking happen at this age as well. And so with magical thinking, um, it's just something to be aware of and, and know and look for. So magical thinking is the thought that my thoughts by themselves can bring about effects on the world. So an example is I was mad at my sister yesterday and now she fell and broke her leg. It must be my fault. Um, I was mad at grandma and now she doesn't remember who I am, right? That's that kind of magical thinking that just my thoughts or something I did has caused all of this in the world. Um, I'll give you a quick example of a patient I worked with when I worked in the hospital. He was um, towards the end of the stage. So he was about five and he was coming for heart surgery and we were, he had a doll with him and he called him doll boy. And as we were just kind of talking about doll boy, um, we, I was asking questions about the different things we saw on Doll Boy, and he told me there was this black circle on his chest. And we, when we got to that part, he said, "Well, you know, Doll Boy was bad, so Doll Boy has to have heart surgery." Um, and so he had drawn that. He was able to put words to it, which is really great. Um, but certainly an example of how that magical thinking—he felt like he was going to be punished. He was being punished uh, with heart surgery because he'd done something bad. We're certainly at this age very eager to try new things. We still want to do it all on our own. Um, and we have less stranger anxiety usually. So how do we help our preschoolers? We certainly want to build on those basic explanations and we can start normalizing medical terms for sure. So don't be afraid to use words like dementia and Alzheimer's um, as you're explaining things. Be aware that questions may increase in frequency. Um, children at this age also start getting really curious about how the body works. So they may want to ask you questions about the brain, how the body works, um, and they may ask them at unexpected times, right? It might be at the dinner table, it might be at church, it might be out in the grocery store. Um, but some examples of some explanations we could use would be grandma's dementia causes her brain not to work like yours and mine. It's harder for her to remember things and sometimes she asks the same thing over and over. Um, this may be a simple comment on the way home after visiting grandma of, you know, did you notice today that grandma was asking the same questions over and over um, and see what they say. Another one is grandma has dementia and makes her brain sick. And because of that, sometimes she doesn't remember us. The, the piece of that of talking about your brain being sick is certainly to help children understand it's not like the sick that they get when they get a cold but that grandma's brain is sick and it's not gonna get better. It's not because anybody did anything wrong. It's not because she was bad or you were bad, but that her brain is sick and it's causing it not to work the right way. Another thing to think about, especially starting with this age is, um, and, and at all ages really, is how do we help prepare our children ahead of time? Sorry. So if um, our children are gonna visit a loved one, in that maybe a long-term care facility for the first time, or they're going to grandma's new home for the first time. Let's prepare them with simple steps and give them a job, right? Tell them what's going to happen in order and tell them what they can do. So an example of this would be, you know, first we will sign in at the front desk. Then we're going to walk to grandma's room. While we're walking, we might even see some of grandma's friends in the hallway. You can say hi if you want to. When we get to grandma's room, remember your job is to hang up the picture you made for her. So they kind of know what to expect. They know they're gonna see other people and they have something to do when they get to grandma's room. So if, if they're nervous, if grandma is, is not quite ready yet for an interaction, well, my job is to go find a special place to put that picture up, right? So we've got a little bit of preparation. The great thing about nowadays is we've got technology to help us with our preparation. So we certainly can take pictures ahead of time of here's what, here's the desk we're gonna sign in at, here's what grandma's room looks like, here's where she eats, all of those kinds of things. We can do that, we can do that ahead of time. 
we can take a video. We can also, of course, use things like FaceTime and Zoom and let them see and interact with grandma before they actually go and visit her. So uh, preparation is always a good thing. The one thing I would say is avoid preparing too soon or too late with this group. So especially with our preschoolers, if I if our visit is on Friday, I'm not going to talk to my child on Monday about this. We might start talking about how we're going to go visit grandma, but I'm not going to go into all those details until maybe the night before or maybe a few hours before even because we don't want to overwhelm and we also want that we want it to be fresh in their minds. So those are just uh, some basic tips when we think about preparing children and also use sensory explanations to help them understand when you're thinking about what you're going to tell them of of what they're going to see, smell, hear, um, you know, is it, it, grandma's room smells like when mommy wipes down the kitchen, it smells fresh and clean, you know, those types of things so that they can be prepared for that. Um, another slide on our preschoolers, again, I told you this is a big group. There's a lot happening here. So build in opportunities to express magical thinking or to address any of it. So um, our kids aren't always going to tell us, right? They don't have all of the words to tell us everything they're feeling or thinking, but um, it may come out in their art or their play. And just find opportunities to remind your child that none of this has happened because of anything they thought, said, or did. It's not their sister's fault. It's not grandpa's fault. Um, there's, there, there's nothing that caused this. Help your child label their feelings and let them see you express your feelings. It's okay for them to see you sad. It's okay for them to see you frustrated. And it can be kind of a teaching opportunity. Um, help them label those feelings. So it made mommy sad today when we went to visit grandpa and he didn't remember my name. Um, you know, letting them know is okay. And then of course, ending with some open-ended outlets for play. We just touched on this, but they're going to tell us more through their play than they will with their words. And so being a good observer and seeing what they're doing and asking questions about what they're doing um, can really help you get an idea of how they're coping and processing what's going on. So our school age group, they are concrete operational. And we've moved into this um, industry versus inferiority. So this is another huge um, jump. Our social world is certainly expanding as school becomes um, our primary source of engagement. We can think more logically and organize information better. This is where we're really developing that self-concept and feelings of competence. So this is when I'm good or bad at things or um, winning becomes very important. Children of this age love to play board games, things like that where they can win or master something. We're starting to really be able to perspectives take, so I can I can kind of start to recognize that um, someone else might think differently than me, and I've kind of mastered the concept of reversibility and conservation of thought. So how do we help our school age friends? Um, you know, really providing honest information to the level of detail that that individual needs. Remember, you know your child best. Um, and this isn't a one-time conversation. So it may be that we introduce this idea and, and we continue over time having follow-up conversations. Um, you know, certainly a more complex answer would be grandma has a disease called Alzheimer's. It's making her brain change. The parts of her brain that send messages to each other aren't working the right way and information is getting tangled up. It makes it hard for her to remember things and do certain things. It may also make her act different. Um, you know, explaining even at this age that th the brain is the control center of the body. And when the brain um, starts getting things confused, it makes it very hard for, for grandma to do things. So uh, you can add on, you can add more detail, let them ask their questions. Um, I don't know, but tell me what you think is always an okay response to. So asking those open-ended questions, not just to check for understanding, but to hear about their experiences. What did you think about visiting grandma today? Um, it's always a great opportunity to give them the floor. Uh, give children at this age the opportunity to help without forcing them. Um, we certainly don't wanna make them do something they don't feel comfortable with, but um, what alternatives are there then? If they don't want to be hands-on, what else can we do to help them still feel connected to grandma or grandpa? And again, prepare them for visits and let them help develop that plan. So today we're gonna see grandma, what, um, what would you like to bring with you? Or is there anything special you would like to do with grandpa? And, you know, and it may be, oh yeah, I wanna bring my journal or I wanna show grandpa my new trophy or 
whatever those things are. And then also thinking about, okay, well, there might be some downtimes where um, you may be playing by yourself. What would you like to bring with you um, during those times? And then certainly finding opportunities to help make memories and talk about past experiences, looking at pictures, talking about, you know, things that you had all done together before, um, all of those things can be important. All right, we are, we are rocking right away, but I know we're already running on short on time. Um, in our adolescent group, we're really looking at that 12 to 18 year old age group. We're now in formal operations. And we're in this identity versus role confusion stage. So this is, I really want to be independent. I'm thinking about not just my thoughts, myself, but where I fit in the world. Um, my peers are certainly vital to my, to my everyday life. I may be um, more willing to take risks. And I can think abstractly. I have more logic. Um, doesn't mean this is a tough group. Doesn't mean I always make the right choices, even though I can do it. Um, but I am able to think past, present, future, or those kinds of things. We really see the emergence of uh, the concept of personal fable here and imaginary audience. And so personal fable is really that idea of no one's ever felt these feelings before. No one has ever been so in love before like I have. This is just all unique and no one understands me. And the idea of imaginary audience is that everybody's looking at me. If I go in that room, everyone is staring at me and they're gonna be judging me and thinking about me. So keeping that in mind, what do we do to help our adolescents as they um, deal or process with, with a loved one having dementia? We can talk about diagnosis and prognosis, right? Because we can forward think. Um, so we can talk about prognosis. We can discuss not just what this means for our loved one who has dementia, but what it, how it's gonna impact our entire family. Is grandma coming to live with us now? What's that gonna look like? You know, what's the impact? Help them find ways to continue to connect. So is it that um, they both love to play chess or they both love to paint or you know do puzzles, things like that, familiar activities that may be enjoyable for both of them and they're always great. When we're concerned about our peer groups finding ways to problem solve, our teens might feel resentful if they're asked to, to provide care for their loved one. And they may also feel anxious about having their friends around their loved one with dementia, especially if there might be behaviors that they're concerned about or could be embarrassed by. And the best thing we can do is certainly encourage open communication. Easier said than done when we live in this tech-driven age and, and cell phones are our primary source of communication. So certainly I understand that. But being good listeners and just being available, it may not be a face-to-face -face conversation. It might be a text uh, exchange, right? But just being available to help support your teenager. And then certainly outlets for self-expression, video journaling, journaling, um, art, things like that, certainly, and um, getting the school involved, you know, if we need to get the guidance counselor involved or things have changed um, so drastically that you feel like you need some extra help, letting the school know is always a good thing. Okay, so that is my quick uh, synopsis of, of what development looks like and maybe ways we can help tackle um, communicating with our children about our loved one who has dementia. Um, this is really my favorite piece of this whole presentation. So if you take nothing else away, take this away. Um, think about talking to your children using the six C's. So what is it called? How do we help normalize those words, right? It's called Alzheimer's. It's called Lewy body dementia. Help me get familiar with those words so it doesn't feel so scary. Did I cause it? Is it something that I did wrong? I remember that magical thinking. So helping to address that. Can I catch it? Can I give it to others? Can I cure it? You know, what is it going to look like? Are they going to get better? Who will take care of me? Remember, we're still a little bit egocentric. So what's going to happen to me if my mom has to go help grandma every Saturday? Well, you know, you're going to go with dad and do X, Y, and Z, or you're going to get to go over to the neighbors while mom goes and helps grandma. Um, and will I always be connected to the person that I love? So what kinds of activities can we do to foster that as well? So called, cause, catch, cure, care, connected. I think those are the big, the big takeaway. And, and at the end of the day, remember, it's okay not to know all the answers. And it's okay to tell your child that you don't know. You know, that's a good question, Megan. Let's, let's think about that. Let me ask and I'll get back to you. 
Uh, it's also okay, again, for them to see you upset or cry or frustrated and, again, share that with them. Certainly give practical advice. So when you're talking, so when you're talking with grandma, it will help if you speak more slowly. That way she has time to think about what you've said. Frame things in the positive. Help children understand what they can do. Grandma loves it when you hold her hand, or grandma loves when you read her her favorite book, or when you sit quietly and watch a show with her. Grandma likes it when you use your inside voice best. So what can we bring for you to play with that will help you use your inside voice? Again, remember, don't force that interaction. Um, you know, go at your child's lead. Monitor your child's feelings when spending um, time with a loved one with dementia. So this is super important, right? Because we don't want either person. We want to respect both people involved and their dignity. And we want to make sure that it's a positive experience. So reassure your child that it's okay if they don't know what to do. And that you're going to be there with them. You know, it's okay to not know what to say when if grandma says something that you don't understand. It's okay to be quiet. Um, for younger children, you know, it might be best if visits are short and certainly um, planned around their schedule, right? So not during a nap time or not when they're hungry, things like that. Uh, use a signal or code word. So if your child's old enough to tell you, hey, I really don't like it when this happens when we see grandma. Maybe we can come up with a code word and you may step out and go to the car or, you know, go, go into the kitchen, whatever it is, but that signal or code word so that everybody kind of knows what's going on. And then always follow up afterward. Ask those open-ended questions. How did you feel? What did you think? Did anything seem different today? Um, and, and then give them those outlets for play to process it through play. Um, again, sometimes talking is overrated, but we're going to see a lot in play. And last, just remember, you know your child best. Trust yourself and follow your child's lead. They're going to let you know what they need. Um, and it's not a right or wrong. You know, just trust yourself and trust that you know your child best. My last tip, certainly, this feels very cliche to even say, but um, especially in this sandwich generation, take care of yourself. Self-care is so important. You have so many demands on your time. You're worried about your, your elder your loved one who's dealing with dementia and its effects. You're also taking care of children. You're also very likely working. So there's a lot of things happening all at once. And um, sometimes you've just got to take care of yourself um, to be able to pour into other people. Resource-wise, um, just some quick websites. Certainly um, the Alzheimer's Association has a lot of different resources for kids and teens. Banner Health um, has some good resources, and also Alts Tennessee um, has some good resources, support groups, things like that, ways to get involved in our local community. There is a good video I found with talking with children about dementia. It's actually based out of England, but it's a good four-minute video that can also lead to some good jumping-off points. Book-wise, we um, there's a book by a child life specialist named Kathleen McHugh. She wrote a book called How to Help Children through a parent series illness that gives some good, good points. Um, we talked about the Remember Balloons in our video last week. And then there's also a workbook, Please Explain Alzheimer's Disease to Me, a children's story and parent handbook about dementia. Um, what I will say about any of these is that um, vet them first, you know your child best. So kind of look at this information, see what might be useful, see what might be overwhelming for them. Some kids want all the details, some kids want just the very basics. Um, and, and then use them as opportunities for conversation. Okay, so I am finished. That is what I've got for you guys today. I know we're a few minutes past time, but I would be happy to take any questions or have any conversations if you all have anything for me. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So I will thank you all for your time. We're gonna um, add this to our website too, if you wanna go back to it. And if you have any questions or want any other resources, you are welcome to email me. My email is Megan, M-E-G-A-N, at elderlawetn.com. Um, and I wish everybody a happy and safe holiday season. And again, I just thank you for taking the time to join me today. Have a great afternoon.